am the one keeping the storm at bay. <laughs> the Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power Season 2 pivots back to the remainder of the plot and those left hanging after the battle for the Southlands failed horribly, following two episodes primarily devoted to the elves and sporadically featuring the dwarves, harfoots, and wizards. An early scene from, The Eagle and the Scepter, the third episode, shows Elendil attempting to take Barak, Isildur's horse, back to Numenor with them before releasing the distraught animal. On his return journey, the horse encounters orcs instead of his master, after putting up a valiant battle, he runs into the Black Forest, where nothing survives and even the orcs are afraid to pursue. For what reason is that? Perhaps that has something to do with the enormous spiderweb that surrounds Isildur. At this time, I expressed my gratitude to my lucky stars. I don't have a serious arachnophobia since all over the cave that Isildur is in, little, spiders, that is, spiders the size of dinner plates, begin to hatch from their eggs. Isildur gives the command for Barek to depart, and soon after, a bigger threat appears, prompting the other spiders to follow suit. It's Shelob, you recognize and adore her. He manages to hold her off long enough to mount Barek and escape the den, The Rings of Power, Season 2 Episode 3, Numenor laments the dead, Elendil, who is grieving the loss of the king in Numenor across the sea, is reprimanded by his daughter Arian for showing greater grief for the king than for his son. She tells Elendil that since she believes there is another party to blame, he doesn't need to put the guilt on himself. He never gets a satisfactory response from her before Queen Muriel and her cousin Farazan show up for the funeral. Farazan is already making a big show of himself for the visiting nobility, even though it's a serious occasion. Muriel is more worried about the here and now when a mourning mother approaches her on the dais, upset that she has no one to grieve for. Muriel asks the woman she lost and gives her an opportunity to express her sadness before Elendil steps in. Now that her official reign over Numenor is off to such a rough start, will Muriel's empathy serve her well, as Farazan approaches Muriel in the king's old chambers, she is going through her father's possessions. She notices a thick bangle, and Farazan notices her need to hide it. He tells her that he was looking for her to help her choose a color to wear to her coronation, and she puts it on before he knows what she has been staring at. He offers her the choice of scarlet, which signifies Numenor's future, or white, which represents its past. Now, to make a point, if it were up to me, I would pick one of the two, but what will Muriel decide? She informs him that she will dress in white, just like her father did, since all she can recall about that day is his attire, that is, aside from the fact that an eagle also made an appearance during the ceremonies. Farazan informs her that the sighting of an eagle would be fortunate, and she resolves to adhere to custom. She's determined to stick to her guns, even though Farazan insists he prefers the red to signify the arrival of a new monarch, Kiman openly declares that the queen is unfit to rule because she is now blind when Farazan, Irian, and Lord Belzegar join him at the tavern. Though many thought Belzegar's claim to the throne was stronger, especially in light of the lost battle, he nevertheless reminds Farazan that they almost picked him to rule instead. Upon Farazan's declaration that many is insufficient, Irian hints that she may be able to expand the pool of potential converts. Enraged that they're all sitting there plotting against Muriel yet none of them faced the risk that the others did in the Southlands, Isildur's friend Valendil breaks up the conspiratorial conference. He tells Kiman not to disrespect the queen or he will have to account to Valendil. He also reminds Kiman in particular that he was there when Kiman was not, and that Muriel's illness was partly caused by her trying to save Isildur. Irian has the decency to appear momentarily guilty. Irian's humiliation is short-lived, as she informs the business that she has discovered something illicit and hazardous. We witness Muriel searching for this object with the bangle she stole from her father. Which also happens to be a key to his tower. In The Rings of Power Season 2 Episode 3, Middle-earth gets ready for war, while they dwell in relative safety now, Adar tells a worried orc they will never truly be safe while he is alive and gets his orcs ready for war against Sauron across the sea. 
The orcs in Rings of Power are given a human touch, as one of them tells Adar that he is worried about his partner and infant son before heading back to check on them. This is in contrast to the Lord of the Rings film series, which never really gave the orcs a purpose other than to serve Sauron and Saruman. Then, a troll with a skull on his head stomps into their camp, looking for Sauron too. Celebrimber extended an invitation for Durin and Dissa to visit him over in a region. He makes them an offer, in order to help the dwarf lords in their battles, he will make rings for them. He says the power in those rings may enable them to repair the mountain. The two conclude that Mithril is required to create the rings, and Celebrimber offers to create them in return for the priceless ore, since the two of them are still not speaking, Durin is reluctant to bring the topic up with his father, King Durin. However, Anatar reassures them that this agreement will greatly benefit their kingdom and may even help to heal the split. Although he is technically correct, in my opinion, it is racketeering to be the source of the issue and then propose to sell the solution for whatever price. Without Elrin's guidance, Durin is reluctant to strike a contract, and Anatar lavishes enough praise that the dwarf becomes suspicious. Dissa requests some time to think things over in an attempt to defuse a fight before it starts, and Celebrimber accedes despite Anatar's wishes, whatever bizarre the answer to their issues may be, they are not in a position to reject it, so as soon as they depart, Dissa insists that Durin tell his father about the idea. Or she will do it for him. Anatar informs Celebrimber back at the forge that Gil-galad has stopped producing more rings because he feels the dwarves are undeserving of their power. Of course these are lies, that's scarcely his logic, but even so, it's enough to make Celebrimber act. He tells Anatar that he will write to the High King to let him know that the forge is closing and to praise him on how wonderfully the rings worked. What's a small white lie, after all, to help you fulfill your life's purpose, the people in Khazad-dum want to beg the king to release the grain stockpiles, which will last for a few months at best, according to Narvi, the king's advisor. Prince Durin, who has come to deliver Celebrimber's proposition to him, joins him instead of the merchants to discuss the petition. Beyond that, Durin finally extends an apology to his father as well, which the king acknowledges but does not truly accept. Durin admits that he doesn't trust the power being provided before the king departs. In Rings of Power, Season 2 Episode 3, Isildur and Arendar reunite returning to the desolation that was once called the Southlands, Isildur and Berek proceed and pause at a marsh where the pools are full of corpses. This is the same dead marshes that viewers of the two towers will be familiar with, added to which is the knowledge of how those bodies ended up there in the first place. Not alone for long, though, as Isildur emerges from the marshes to find an overturned cart surrounded by dead horses and humans, and the lone survivor, Estrid, Neatal, stabs him in the thigh believing he is an orc. He tells her he's headed toward the coast, and she informs him the boats have departed already, as she went there to look for her fiancé. She identifies him as coming from Numenor. She gives him a chart that shows the location of an ancient Numenorian settlement, which is where Isildur thinks everyone may have vanished. The two stumble upon an orc-attacked man who is dying. The man turns out to be a part of a con to make them stay so they can be robbed, but before they can do much more than beat them up, Arinder, who is running errands, arrives to save them. He suggests that instead of attempting to track down the wild men in order to retrieve Berek, they should go to Pilarger, the village, but he doesn't stay to persuade them because he has urgent problems of his own, the issue at hand. The Funeral for Bronwyn one of my favorite characters in the series from the start has always been Bronwyn, she is a natural leader, a combination of fierce and gentle, and has the kind of forbidden romance arc that makes my romantic heart sing. But it makes fitting that Boniati's character would be developed in this manner given that she has mostly resigned herself to advocacy work, especially with the woman life freedom movement in Iran, for which I am incredibly thankful as an Iranian woman living abroad. Though I do understand her decision to leave, it doesn't mean I won't be sad to see her go or that I won't miss her, Theo, Bronwyn's son, helps Arinder fire the pyre even though he is hesitant to take the elf's consolation. Theo applies the mending techniques his mother taught him before she died to Isildur's thigh the next day. Outside, Arinder tells Theo the village is lucky to have a healer like him, though he doesn't want to accept the title, maintaining it still belongs to his mother. 
Arinder tries to convince Theo to not let his anger and pain eat him up, because that kind of pain is draining, but Theo firmly puts Arinder in his place, telling him he's not his father, and with Bronwyn gone, they don't need to maintain any sort of relationship anymore. Isildur finds Theo sulking by an old aqueduct, and though the two are just making casual conversation, Isildur invites Theo to come to Numenor to see the impressive architecture someday. I mention this only because, with Theo so adrift, it would be interesting to see him leave Middle-earth to find new purpose in Numenor one day, or even to realize he'd rather go back. As it stands, though, the teen is feeling reckless, and tells Isildur to meet him by the aqueduct that night if he wants to go get Barek back, as soon as they're gone, Estrid goes back to what she was doing before they discovered her, sharpening her knife to remove Sauron's, and now Adar's, mark from the back of her neck. Theo enters the Wildman's camp covertly and poses as Adar's ally, allowing Isildur to leave with Barek. However, as soon as they are successful, an ambush occurs at the camp, forcing Theo to run, straight into an unidentified entity. He shouts out to Isildur, but before the Numenorian can hear him, he has already been taken, it's Muriel's coronation day at last, back in Numenor, and she shows up in her elaborate white gown just as expected. Farazan makes an appearance wearing the crimson outfit he recommended for her. As the ceremony is about to begin, people in the audience start to criticize Queen Elizabeth's selection. Muriel begs the populace to consider who inspires them to speak up and extends an invitation for them to grieve, letting them know she is experiencing it with them. Speaking up for her brother, Irian reveals that Muriel has consulted the Palantir, which she discovered under the old king's guidance. To see how Muriel will respond, Farazan orders the stone to be destroyed after Irian throws it into the crowd and down the stairs. Elendil tries to seize the Palantir as she declares they need it to guide them but the crowd encircles both Elendil and the Queen, causing chaos to break out. The crowd's shouting signals the arrival of an eagle, which seems to be favoring Farazan. If pandemonium hadn't prevailed, however, it's possible that the eagle would have appeared for Muriel instead. As Numenor's leader, Farazan takes over with the people's support, with King Durin, Prince Durin, and Dissa present in delivering Mithril as promised, the massive Rings of Power Season 2 premiere concludes with Anatar and Celebrimber crafting new rings. How exciting! As we move forward into the remainder of the season, at the absolute least, we've caught up with every character that already exists. That's the end, unlock the secrets of storytelling through our video, our YouTube channel's guide to the art of cinema. Join us as we delve into the narratives, the characters, and the sheer enchantment that movies bring to our lives. From script to screen, we've got it all covered. Join us as we analyze, critique, and appreciate the magic of movies, subscribe to our channel for more videos.